right, so welcome. Welcome, everyone. So today we're going to be doing a special interview with two young ladies who have been attending our Knoxville Convocations. And um, it's been a few weeks, and we've been happy to see their beautiful faces almost every Sabbath. So we just wanted to sit down and speak with them, ask them about their life experiences and get to know them a little bit better. And just to hear their testimonies and hear how God has been leading them and how he's still blessing them today. So we want to welcome Nema, say hello. <laughs> and Mona Lisa, hello Mona Lisa. <laughs> okay. So um, I'm just gonna uh, start off with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to come together um, as a group and to speak about your goodness and your love. We thank you for allowing us to have Nema and Mona Lisa here today to share their experiences and to share how you have been so good to them and how you're strengthening them and guiding them on their path. And I pray that as they share their testimonies that they can be an encouragement to others. We pray that you guide our lips and that you may be with our conversation. In Jesus' name we do pray, amen. 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 So first question. So ladies, can you please share with us what is your name and what are you currently doing right now as it relates to school or work? Well, my name is Nema. Um, I'm currently a student um, and I'm studying business in uh, business and business of administration and finance. Um, yeah, that's what I'm currently doing right now. And what about you, Mona Lisa? Well, I'm a nursing student. My name is Mona Lisa Dumbajana. I'm a nursing student here at Southern, and I am uh, hoping to also do medical missionary right after. And my means of work is I'm a call porter. Oh, wonderful. Um, so, you know, ladies, we often share our testimonies as a group, you know, as a means to encourage other young people. And, um, you know, Richard and I, Jerby, all of us, we've, we've shared a lot. You know, Richard and I, I believe we have grown up in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, in fact, we have. And then Jerby, Jerby, you came into the faith, right? Mm -hmm. I was Baptist. Right. She was Baptist and then she converted to Seventh-day Adventism. So we just wanted to know, what is your story? How did you, did you grow up Seventh-day Adventist? That's the first question. And then on top of that, how did you learn about Seventh-day Adventism and present truth? I grew up as, well, I grew up in a in a family of uh, I, I grew up in an Adventist home, basically. Um, as the aspect how I got to know a little bit about the present truth, it was personal research, basically uh, wanting to get closer to God because oftentimes you hear uh, messages with um, the messages that you want to hear. Mm -hmm. It's more like the um, watered down messages all the time. And me coming from Africa, there used to be these preachers that would come to our church and they used to preach these messages to where like I would listen and listen. I was a child, but it's almost like when the preacher was finished, I didn't even want to leave because I wanted to hear more. Um, so when I got here and um, I got to a church where the message, there wasn't really preaching about the present truth. There wasn't like, you know, it was more like... Um, more hearing a speech more than about the word of God. And so I, I began to search for myself and looking for other means for me to get to know more about God. And um, yeah, that's how basically I, I came into the present truth. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I did not grow up Adventist. My mom was um, raised Adventist, but my dad was not. So when they met, they were in the process. He was in the process of converting. And um, since my mom came to America at an early age um, of my childhood and my dad taught at a boarding school, I lived with my grandparents who are Catholic and they're very devoted. So everything we do, you know, um, we also practice tradition within our, um, within our religion, we practice things like paganism. And um, I became so embedded, you know, in my mind, all these things, all the teachings. 
but as I grew up and I came to America, uh, I was now living with my mom and dad, and they were going to church on Saturdays and keeping the Sabbath. But for me, it was so hard because I was so accustomed to, you know, the whole Catholic lifestyle, the whole paganism. Um, but you know, as I started going to church more and participating, I became more and more, um, had the desire to want to learn more. But it was still hard. And I know God is patient and he's so long suffering um, because he knew exactly where I was and how much I desired to learn. And I recall meeting Nema. And that was the time I was actually crying to God. I was so tired of going to public school. I was tired of my, you know, atmosphere. I saw how it was changing me. And when I met her, um, she was, you know, we're learning about Revelation and Daniel, and I didn't understand it. I didn't know anything there was to know about prophecy. And I remember she did, and it bothered me so much because I didn't understand. And here I am as an Adventist, not knowing, you know, the truth about even Jesus' second coming. I didn't know all these events. And um, that's when I went to Southern because I didn't know of other self-supporting um, colleges. I only learned of Oakwood and Southern. So I chose Southern. And when I came here, I chose the last day then class. And in that class, I, we read the great controversy and we read uh, last day events and I got to understand more and more. And I grew more in love with understanding prophecy and present truth. And I think at the same time, Nema introduced me, I think it was to Jeremiah Davis. It was identity crisis. And I actually was also crying for a friend that God could, you know, send my way to help me to understand present truth because it seemed like even my own home church never taught about prophecy, never taught about the times we're in. And there is someone young like myself who could, you know, inspire me and encourage me. And I don't think she even knows the full story, but um with her, I got to understand more, you know, Jeremiah Davis speak more on present truth. And then um, she also sent me Safe to Serve. And that's when I actually learned about you guys and um, the message. And it was just so um, inspiring to see also other young people uh, that are aware of what's going on. And as she mentioned before, all the sermons seem to be watered down. It seemed like everyone was asleep. And I was like, you know, what's going on? But, you know, again, um, God's timing, long suffering uh, is the reason why I, I now know of um, present truth. So, yes, I want to praise God for that. Amen. That's powerful. Any, any, any follow-up questions that you all have for them? I mean, I, I, would, just add a, I would just add to a comment because, you know, I, I think that, you know, this, this discussion is so, um, it's going to be such a blessing and encouragement to other young people because like you were saying, you know, I had a very similar upbringing. I grew up in an Adventist church, um, but I wasn't hearing the messages that should have been, you know, being, being heard from the pulpits. It was like a watered down message and it only kept me at a certain level. You know, there was not really growth in my spiritual walk with Christ. So I was just sort of teeter tottering from the world to the church and back and forth. And of course, my environment and my friends around me, they weren't, they weren't really, you know, trying to better themselves either. So I was kind of stagnant, you know, um, and many young people are going through what you went through, um, even now, you know, and, and, and I believe that you by, you know, sharing, sharing what you're going through and how God is helping you is also going to, you know, help somebody else. Because again, I can definitely relate to what you just said, literally just, the, you know, just, just now, I'm a little older than you are, um, but I experienced that, you know, growing up in the church. And you mentioned prophecy. I never heard of prophecy while I was going to, you know, some of my other church, so my, my old church, my old Seventh-day Adventist church, you know, not until I came as word to present truth, you know, and it opened my eyes to so many things like, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I am living in the last days. Jesus is really, is, is coming soon, you know, and it, it put me more in a mindset to want to be, who actually, you know, to actually want to be ready. I want to be ready for Christ's coming, not because my friends are doing this, not because my family said so, but because the Bible actually is predicting and showing me from signs and, and what have you, you know, that Christ is coming. And, and it's just a blessing to be around other like-minded young people as well who, who have been through it, who are going through it, 
you know, and want to really get to heaven. So, you know, I'm just, I'm, 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 I'm very, you know, elated that you sort of share that with us, even you as well, Nema. But um, I do have um, a question as it relates to, you know, just a spiritual walk with Christ, you know, as you're at, as you're on, you're at, um, you're at school, even at work, you know, there are many distractions, so many distractions for young people. Um, you know, we are one of Satan's prime targets, if not the prime target, because he knows how much of an impact we have on society and can have on our peers. So many distractions to lure us back into the world or worldliness. So Nema, now Mona Lisa, my question to you is like, as a student, um, you know, at, at school or even on your job, you know, what kind of distractions do you face? You know, what distractions, what challenges do you face as you seek to live for God and how do you deal with them? How do you meet these challenges as a young person? Well, uh, I have a bit of a lot of challenges because I attended a public university. Uh, when I came here, I didn't really know a lot of um, Adventist schools or anything like that. So I took what was presented to me and the only Adventist school I kind of knew was um, that I didn't really see any difference between it and a public school. <laughs> and I thought it was gonna easy uh, be thrown into um, seeing other Adventists doing some things that weren't, weren't really um, something that God wanted them to do. And I felt like, you know, maybe that's, you know, I might be easily convinced to do as they do because I think we're in the same boat uh, and that we all are, you know, Christians and things like that. Uh, so, I am attending a public school and one of those challenges that I, I do face or um, I have faced is um, previously I will have like professors um, who, um, who will sometimes put their exams like on Friday evenings to Saturday. And, um, and I'm just like, you know, what do I do with that? Because, you know, last, I believe it was like a year, a year ago, something like that. I had a professor who who put his exam like on Friday evenings, but right before the Sabbath. So to me, being naive, I'm like, okay, I, he gave us three hours to do it. I have like an hour or so I can do it right before sunset. And I was like, okay, I'll do as quickly as I can. Then I'll close my book and then I'll begin my Sabbath. Um, and then I, I got into the middle of my test and I realized there's no way I'm going to finish it. And around that time, I, I had some couple of my Adventist friends who were with me because we were preparing for the Sabbath and we were also preparing to do a Bible study at our university. Um, and so we, I realized, okay, I'm not gonna be able to finish. So I asked for advice for a couple of my Adventist friends and they are like, um, just take your whole laptop with you when we get to the uh, Bible study, just kind of, you know, go out there and finish it. <laughs> And to me, I'm just like, you know, inside of me, I knew this is the Sabbath. I'm not even supposed to be doing this. You know, I know that I'm putting my scholarship at stake and I know that I'm putting, you know, different things on stake here and failing for this class. So what do I do? Um, so I put my laptop in my uh, computer and I decided that I was going to go to um, to this Bible study. But then as soon as I greet people and I do all those kind of things, I'll go at the back of the door and complete my exam. I got there and I just, I could not do it because I realized that, you know, I'm being a hypocrite. A, I'm being a hypocrite. I'm professing one thing, in, but then I'm about to do something else that, you know, and things like that. Yeah. So I was like, you know, it's, if I feel this, then I feel this. There's a, there's a verse that reminded me that says that whatever that you try to save, you will lose, but whatever that you um, lose for his sake, you will gain. And so I, I left, I closed my books and everything and I was like you know I'm not I'm not gonna open my laptop I'm not gonna do anything I'm gonna have this bible study we're gonna fellowship with one another and when the sabbath is over I'll deal with this later and so Sunday came uh, and I called my professor in fact I emailed my professor first and then I went to see him I'm asking him to reopen the exam to me I'm perfect I'm telling him my situation and that I'm a sabbath believer in this and that and he's like nope I'm not doing it. I'm not reopening it. I'm like, okay, there's no problem. But one thing I did thank God is that he say that I won't, you know, put your exams on Saturday, but rather I'll put them what on Thursdays. I was grateful to God and thankful 
um but i was still kind of disappointed in a way because i was like god you say that you're gonna be with me that um you will not he said if i'm faithful to you you're gonna be faithful to me as well and so i left that behind and i just went on with my business i saw him every day it wasn't until four days later that he emailed me and said to me hey i have opened up the exam for you go ahead and you know take it and to me that was a humbling situation because that was something that i was totally unexpecting you know um i was not expecting god to open that way because he had already said no and i knew how strict he was and so as you can see we face different challenges for you being a sabbath keeper and trying to keep god's word and also having um friends who are not really grounded <laughs> and then you think okay what do you do um do you please men or do you please god mm. um so those are the kind of challenges that you face or even at work you know many different things will pop up where they ask you you know come come in come and work mm. and you ask yourself do i you know do i disobey god or do i follow what god has to um has to say and so but it's a personal choice to weigh you know for me <laughs> I would rather obey God than men. Whatever that um, I will lose, I will gain in heaven. <laughs> Amen. That, 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 that. Your testimony was powerful. And for me, it brings to mind just two things listening to your story. One, you know, the test of the Sabbath is going to be the test for all of us in these last days as we see the signs fulfilling. So um, what you're going through now is even practice for that to see whether you will compromise or not. Um, and secondly, for me, it shows me the influence of friends, you know, that you have, how they can either steer you in the right direction or steer you in the wrong direction. But um, in spite of that situation, God was still able to, you know, be, he, he was very present, you know, to allow you to still take the test. So that's a powerful testimony. And I think it's um, something that I needed to hear personally, because these tests are going to come for me and for you and for everyone very soon. So, uh, you know, I, I go to Southern Adventist University and, you know, this is not to ever talk down on them because no one is perfect. Uh, but some of the distractions I faced was here on campus. And why there are distractions for me, it's because these were people who profess to be fellow believers and, you know, that have the truth. And, you know, I recall when I first came here, I was during uh, fall. And, you know, fall is close to Halloween. And I remember Halloween students were decorating faculty members, you know, teachers everywhere, Halloween celebration. And I was shocked because, you know, to me, I, I expected that the, pe the school I had came to would teach me things like, you know, to stand up against Halloween or pagan practice. Um, Another distraction was my, you know, some of my professors, especially one of my theology uh, professor, it was Christian ethics. I remember um, during the class, we had to do a debate. And one of the debates, he gave me the topic, human robot marriage. And my brain, I was praying, I said, God, please do not allow me to be on the side that's supporting it. And in his mercy, he did not allow me to be on the side that supported it. But I had to pray in my heart and I watched other people, like it makes you not to be grounded because it makes you think of the other side. And I was like, what is this? I struggled and I went to tell my mom, I was like, mom, look what I'm learning here at school. And you know, that's the time I was even battling, like, should I leave the school? Maybe I should just leave it. Maybe I should just, you know, go to Heartland, go to because I had already discovered you know now I discovered the self-supporting schools through canvassing and I was like you know I'm just quitting what is this that I'm learning but I learned about Daniel and actually he's the the story of Daniel is actually the story that inspired me because I thought wow you know he, he was given all these teachings everything was presented to him you know Babylonian teachings I'm here I'm at a school where People profess to know the truth, but I should be grounded in what I believe. So no matter what people present to me, that I am confident that I will not waver and I will not be moved by other people. And another distraction I faced was my own peers. You know, 
um, because one is how I dress, you know. Um, many people here mock the dress reform, mock Ellen G. White. And I have my own friends, you know, we were playing a game of Uno. And there's this card in the middle where it's a new card now. It's um, blank. And when you someone pulls that, they can make you do whatever you want to, you know, what they want you to do. Like, you know, uh, go jump or something, you know, go drink the whole bottle of water. And I remember someone threw the card on me and say, Mona Lisa, I need you to go outside and scream, pants are better than skirts. And I knew that was a mockery. For my own friends, I knew that was a mockery. And it was a passive one. And I remember uh, the people in the room who were not even playing. They got so excited to, to know Mona Lisa is going to say this that they were all like, go, go do it, go, go. And, you know, it was so painful. It actually really hurt me. And I never confronted them. And many times, you know, when I'm in the house, I'll hear, because we live in the apartment next to the dorm, uh, people come over and sometimes they have talks. Like, you know, uh, I hate those people that, you know, talk about dressing. If you choose to wear a mini skirt to church, go ahead. If you choose to put a cigarette on your Bible, go ahead. And, you know, to me, I'm just like, this is my atmosphere. I'm at an Adventist school. But again, I had to learn to not to be moved, even people who profess to know the truth and are, you know, not living by it. I had to learn for God himself to help me. This is also my own journey. You know, I cannot allow even my own peers to change me. And, you know, sometimes I feel like an outcast. Here at an Adventist school, I feel like an outcast. And that is so painful when you came to a school where you thought everyone around you will, you know, uh, practice what we're taught, even in the spirit of prophecy. But yet you're the outcast. You feel mocked. And, you know, I'm hoping that no one will ever see me as belittling anyone. Because my heart is still, you know, needs so much work in my character. But it's just some of the distractions that I faced personally. But again, the book of Daniel, just knowing the story of Daniel and how he didn't compromise. He didn't allow, you know, uh, certain tests to go against God. When it came to going against God, that's when he marked his line and said no. So as a young person like Daniel, that's something that encourages me. Wow. That's a very powerful testimony because when, uh, okay, so for me, uh, I kind of resonate with Nima's story just a little bit because when I was in college, I was on a scholarship too. And um, with you, Mona Lisa, you said that the class that you, um, that the class that kind of caused more of a struggle for you was ethics. But for me in my school, it was actually humanities. Now, with that class, basically, one time I remember the professor telling us and teaching of us teaching us about different um, like different religions. So he would teach us about all the different religions, and he eventually came to Christianity. And I was kind of interested. I was like, hmm, let's see what he's going to teach us about Christianity. And when he started talking about Christianity, he started saying how. Um, basically saying that the Ten Commandments were no longer valid. And he was like dancing around it. He didn't say it straight up. So I asked him, I raised up my hand, I said, um, excuse me, are you trying to say that the Ten Commandments are no longer valid? He's like, uh, yes and no. And everybody's like, ooh, Jerry's about to teach him a Bible lesson. Jerry's about to, and I was just like, hey, I'm, I'm literally just asking to find out. And the thing is, I was newer into, you know, present truth and studying my Bible on my own. So although I knew he was wrong, I felt bad that that's not something that I was able to defend. All I knew was I'm standing firm on what I believe. I don't care what you're going to try to tell me. This is what the Bible says. I'm going to go study it and I'll come back to you. Because he was also talking about the new and the old, um, what is it? Covenant, the the covenant right? Yes, yes. Specifically that, the new and the old covenant. And I was like, man, how do I explain this? So I had to go and study it for myself. But by the time I was able to fully study it and fully comprehend it, it was already the end of the semester and I was on to the next. 
But the thing is, after the class, I kind of sat back and spoke with him about it. And I was like, you know what? I don't know what to say, but here's my pastor's email. You can talk to him about it and see what he says, you know? But the thing is like, um, going back to what the both of you said, it's important to know that you have to stand firm on what you believe in, regardless of what anybody says to says about what you believe. For you, when it comes to, um, you know, making sure that you're keeping the Sabbath, regardless of what kind of test that the teacher may throw at you. And for you, whenever it comes to ethics and all of those different thought processes that they try to teach us to make us wiser, that we still have to stand on what God says at the end of the day, even if we may not know how to defend it at that very moment, but to just know that God will give you the wisdom to learn so that if you ever have to deal with that, because God will bring us around the same tests if we're failing them and um we'll then be able to successfully explain what we believe and why we believe it because in the midst of that you can be an encouragement now um Nemo, when i was uh saying that i kind of resonate with you in your testimony because i was on a scholarship too and a lot of what i did was always based on what the bible says so if there was something going on in the class where it was like against the Bible, I was like, I don't know if I want to participate in this. I don't care if you mess up my grade. I don't care if I put this scholarship at stake. I believe what I believe and that's what it is. You know, so that goes to show that even when we may have things put in place for us to succeed and the school system kind, kind of tries to go against that, we always know that God will still have our back regardless, regardless of what it is. So that your, your testimonies are very powerful. And I'm pretty sure that we are, us that are on this um, platform here are not the only ones that can resonate with you, but you're encouraging a lot of people that are even watching. So my question for you is, um, so the two of you have been attending our meetings here in Knoxville. So what we wanted to ask is, what effect have the messages had on your life personally? because we know that we've been hearing a lot about the last generation uh, the last generation as of late and hearing about what things are transpiring around us and how we must stand firm for God in this time how exactly have the messages been touching you personally it's um it's really encouraging because they, you do get a time where you kind of feel down and you kind of feel like, you know, you need that encouragement. And so, um, cause at times, you know, you get to a point where like Mona Lisa stated, people will mock you, believe it or not, they will. Um, and so when you have, you know, I guess seeing other people, you are more encouraged when you hear messages, when you meet your brothers and sisters in Christ, you feel, so much encouraged to keep going you know um and so I, i'm really blessed whether it was watching online or actually getting to uh attend personally uh, i was blessed and um that is something that i would encourage those <laughs> who are near if they they are they should really come because you know it, it is a blessing truly i i agree with Neymar because for me it was also like a revival because sometimes we really need that, you know, in the midst of all, you know, concentrating on school, concentrating on your assignments and, you know, me, 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 me. This actually, you know, changes your focus and place it on God. And uh, sometimes, you know, you're like, okay, I do my devotions. I, I do it, you know, when I wake up, when I sleep, but sometimes you need more. And this felt like, you know that strong meat that I had to eat and I am really grateful that God gave me that opportunity to be able to hear messages that not only affected me but affected those around me you know my own family like my parents I actually got to watch it online and sometimes I question my dad and I'm like you know did he really watch it and I'm like please what was it about and he told me the whole sermon and it blew my mind because you know um, my dad doesn't really uh, believe in LNG White fully. And he's still in the process. The Holy Spirit is still working on him. 
So it, I saw it just, you know, changing my life as well, but more for my family too. Amen. Amen. And, and as you continue to stay faithful, it is going to rub off on your family members and even your friends as well, because um, I can definitely resonate with both of your testimony, but I don't want to take the time to share mine. Um, but Christian ethics, I dealt with that, you know, dealing with um, family members who do not believe the same truths that you believe, all of these things, they, they are going to be these tests like this in um, this time that we're living in, but we just have to stay grounded. And that's why we want to come on here on this platform to talk with you all, encourage you, and, and let it be an encouragement to others. But um, as it relates to coming to the meetings, let me understand this correctly. So Mona Lisa, how did you first start coming to the meetings? Like who invited you? Well, Naima actually invited me. Um, I think she first invited me when you guys were in Nashville. Okay. But that time I was here on campus, so I couldn't drive all the way to Nashville, but my parents were. But this time, you guys were one hour and 30 minutes away, and I was like, you know, I'm going. The first meeting, you know, I didn't attend because I had to teach Sabbath school. Mm -hmm. But week, you know, I made it an effort, and I, I was like, I'm going. Awesome, awesome. So, so Nema invited you. You started coming to the meetings, and yes. you have been bringing other youth to the meetings, correct? Yes. yes. So I want to ask you, what prompted you to do so? Like, why did you decide, hey, I want to bring other young people, some of my friends or associates to the meeting? Okay, well, it first started with, you know, when I first came here and I was going to churches, and I would express to my friends how the sermons were watered down. And many of my friends agreed with me. And we kept, you know, church hopping, trying to look for a church that had, you know, the messages that we were looking for. And when Neymar told me that you guys are in Knoxville, I was like, I need to use this opportunity because I had already started watching you guys through, you know, Neymar showing me. So I knew what you guys were going, you know, what the, not like knew exactly, but I knew what you guys, you know, talk about. And I was like, I need Southern students to hear this. So by the help of the Holy Spirit, you know, I tried to invite whoever could come. I only had one car. So that made it challenging. So I had to bring one set of, you know, group of friends and the other friends would be like, why didn't you invite me? So I was like, okay, next week. So that means I abandoned this people and then allowed the other group to come. So it was, you know, very difficult, but I still, um, Praise God that he allowed them to watch it. And those that couldn't come got to watch it online. Amen. Amen. Um, you know, Mona Lisa, we've, we've dubbed you the woman at the well. Nema <laughs> <Name> too. <laughs> Nema too, yeah. <laughs> we've dubbed you the women at the well uh, in John 4. They went back and called the whole city, uh, mm -hmm. calling all of Southern. Um, so praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for that. Um, just very encouraging, very encouraging. I'm, I'm so, I'm encouraged by, you know, what you both have been sharing um, in the faith, you know, and, and, and it's, it, it's, it's inspiring. Um, it's admirable. And, um, you know, I'm, I, I see why, you know, this, this platform here will be, again, I'm, I'm speaking with certainty that this platform will be a blessing to those hereafter who will listen because they can resonate to every everything that you both are going through. So, you know, just rest assured with that. But, you know, as we come to a close, we don't want to, you know, spend it out too long. But my, my final question to you both, you know, as you're, going through, as you're going through your walk with Christ, as you're, you know, meeting and greeting friends, what type of encouragement would you leave with somebody, you know, as young, as young people? You know, what kind of encouragement would you leave with someone who is seeking for truth um, and wants to, be faithful to God. Uh, what I will leave is um, be faithful um, in all that you do, um, in whatever circumstances that you may find yourself in, be faithful um, and trust God. Um, it may seem like, you know, you're tr trusting God in a little small matter or you're expecting that it's going to be um, you're going to have faith when you have like a huge problem that coming up in the future, but no, it's those small things. If you're faithful to him, they will build up. So be faithful and be strong. And no matter who says what, 
just um, trusting God. I would say to those that are, you know, seeking the truth and wanting to be faithful to God, I would tell them God is not hard of hearing. You know, um, as we learn that there's nothing that we feel that God doesn't feel also. And I know that for me, I had to cry like literal tears on my knees for God to send me the truth. And he did. And I encourage that you keep, you know, asking God because, again, he loves you and he does desire you to know the truth. And uh, pertaining to, you know, to be faithful, I believe that there's a greater reward in being faithful to God. You are more blessed by God than trying to please men. And I, the times we're in, we already know that there's no reward here on earth that's going to last, you know every reward we have is going now is in heaven so you know just to store their treasures in heaven by being faithful to him amen that was powerful thank you for those encouraging words and i can say personally i look forward to seeing you two every sabbath <laughs> and i enjoy the time that we spend together because you know um seeing other young people in the faith is very encouraging and um it's just a blessing that we're able to spend time with each other talking about how, you know, talking about the different topics that we talk about after, um, after the service. And um, it's really a blessing to have godly fellowship, especially during these times, because I remember, um, I think it was a while back, we did a few polls asking people what, asking people that um, are they more prone to leave the faith or stay in the faith if they have other people encouraging them. And a lot of people said, yeah, it's pretty hard to stay in the faith if you don't have friends of like mind that will help you to encourage you. So it's really important that we all keep each other uplifted and continue to keep in contact with other young people to make sure that we're keeping them strong in the faith as God is strengthening us because he's giving us so that we can give to others you know, and to also encourage people that may not be of the faith to come and just give God a try, you know, so that's always something that um, we need to make sure that we're doing, that we're making sure to share his love with other people. So with that being said, we want to thank you to Nema and Mona Lisa so much for sharing your testimonies with us. They are very encouraging. And once again, we know that we're not the only ones that were encouraged, but other people will be encouraged by your testimonies as well. And with that being said, this session comes to a close. Um, would anybody like to pray? Any volunteers? Okay, I'll pray. <laughs> okay. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for allowing us to come together and to speak about your goodness and speak about how you have stood up for us and how you have helped us in our trying times. I thank you so much for allowing Nema and Mona Lisa to come and to share their testimonies and share how you have been so good to them. I pray that you may continue to strengthen them, that you may continue to guide them on their walk and on their journey and that you may use them to be an encouragement to many souls because we know that you're coming, it's very soon. And we want to get ready and get our friends and family members ready as well. We thank you and we pray all these things in Jesus' holy and precious name, amen.